Let's finish with something that some people believe is evidence against God, and that is evil. This is a case that my dad worked in 1974. It was a murder of a 10-year-old girl in 1972. This is my dad. He hates that picture because he, uh, he feels like he looks bad in that photograph. He does look bad in that photograph, he does. First of all, he's got a big crease across his chest there, not just from the picture of being folded, but, but he's got this polyester suit. He hated that polyester suit. And then he's got his butt sticking out here, which is actually just his gun, but he thinks it looks like his butt, so he always hated this picture. He's walking a guy across to the courtroom who confessed to killing this 10-year-old girl. Every horrific thing he did to her, it's a thousand-page transcript, and none of it is true. He didn't kill this little girl. He was crazy, but we excluded him with blood evidence on the eve of the trial. This case is still unsolved. But the terrible things that happened to this little girl, who I will call Jackie, were really hard to process. This is true evil. But like every act of evil I've ever worked, certain things had to come together in a certain unusual way in order for it to occur. First of all, she was a very trusting girl who would get in a car with somebody. Not every kid's that way. And not only that, it happened on a holiday. I said it happened on Thanksgiving, but in the book I said it happened on Christmas. This is still an open case, so I've changed it a little bit. But it was a holiday, and her parents were cooking dinner they didn't even pay attention to what she was doing. If it's not a holiday and she's not that trusting, this never would have happened. But not only that, this guy who did this to her, trust me, he's got some issues. If he's like other pedophile killers I've worked, he's probably had a bad upbringing himself that led him to this place. If he doesn't have that bad upbringing and it's not a busy holiday and she's not that trusting, this doesn't happen. Not only that, it had access to a place to take her because we found her the next day, dropped off in Oxnard, one county north of us on the rocks. But he had a place to hold her for a day. If he doesn't have that place and a way to get her there, none of this happens. And not only that, he had unbelievable opportunistic timing. I don't think he stalked her and watched her for some period of time. He just happened to be driving down the road when she happened to be available. Oh my gosh. If this set of circumstances doesn't happen just like this, this entire thing doesn't happen, and the relationships are very complicated. I may never know as an investigator what set of circumstances had to align perfectly that caused Jackie to suffer this evil event. And that's the problem. In the universe we have today, we also know that there are good reasons to believe God exists, but there's also one good reason to think he doesn't. I've already talked to you about the first seven. These are all things that point toward God. The best explanation outside the room. This is why we call this stuff inculpating evidence. The other kind of evidence that points away from somebody like an alibi is called exculpating evidence. Is the presence of evil and injustice in the universe the one thing that disqualifies an all-loving, all-powerful God. Because think about it. How could a God like this allow that to happen to Jackie? Epicurus is quoted with this phrase. I think it's pretty powerful, and it's millennia old. This is from about 600 B.C. I'm sorry, about 300 B.C. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Well, then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? If there's evil in the world, well, how can you say there's an all-powerful, all-loving God? He either is too lame to stop it, which means he's not all-powerful, or doesn't care to stop it, which means he's not all-loving. He's disqualified. And that's the question. Is God disqualified? I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. When I find there's a way I can explain a suspect's involvement, even though it appears to be exculpating evidence, I have to look at the, those. Here, I think there are seven things, five or six, seven things that might explain why God would ever allow an evil act. And it's very complicated. I think he has to have a proper view of eternity, a proper view of free agency and the nature of what love really is, a proper understanding of the role it can be used to develop character, how it calls us to him, uh, how sometimes evil just happens because you make bad decisions, not on God. And we have a limited understanding of the relationship between all these things. Why do I say this? Because in the end, all of these things have to be assessed before we consider any single act of evil. Let me just break out one of these. I break out all of them in the book. I'll break out one of these to show you what I mean. As an atheist, I had a problem with the problem of evil. 
But you shouldn't as a Christian, really. Here's what I mean. As an atheist, I believe that all of life was a line segment between two dots called birth and death. I expect to get 90 years pain-free in those two dots. If anything happens to steal away my pain-free 90 years, I'm going to be upset, and I'm going to see it as an act of evil. So for example, if I get sick at 40, and then I suffer for 10 years before I die of cancer, I'm going to be upset, and I'm going to call this evil. Why? Because it robbed me of what I expected, because my view of life was the 90-year line segment. Got it? But what if I'm foundationally wrong about my presupposition? What if life is something other than this? What if life is not really a line segment between life, birth rather, and death, but is actually a ray that begins at birth, runs through a point we call death, then continues on infinitely? What if that is a proper view of life? What if the Christian worldview is true? Well, you know if you've been, how many of you in this room had a major surgery in the first year of your life? There are probably some people who did. You did. I'll bet you that was no fun. I bet you your parents were worried sick. If you'd have passed away in that first year, they would have seen that as evil. But now, years later, how old are you now? 12. By the time you're 10 or 12 years old, You probably don't even remember the pain you suffered as an infant because you've now had 10 years since the event. As a matter of fact, when you move further and further away from an evil, painful episode, it has less and less impact on your life. You already know that, right? So what you might call evil here has to be measured in terms of the context of your entire life. This is actually, for those of us who are circumcised, something similar, okay? (laughs) You drop dead on that day, you're thinking, this really stinks, right? What kind of life is this? But by the time you're one, you can't remember. Well, if if our worldview is correct and we have a proper understanding of eternity, then I don't care what mess happens in your life or how grievous it may be, it has to be measured in the context of eternity. And as you do that, your entire material existence ends up being a fraction of a millisecond compared to eternity. So all I'm saying is that now you have to measure evil in a different context. So a proper understanding of eternity is one of seven things we have to consider when evaluating what real evil is in the context of any evil event. So if someone says to me, why would God allow that thing to happen to Jackie? There can't be a God who would allow that to happen to Jackie. Well, I can't tweet that back to you in 140 characters. I can't respond to that in a paragraph on Facebook. I won't even try. You shouldn't try either. Because it turns out it's a complex set of events. And not only that, they're in different proportions to one another. And they have different relationships to one another and causal connections to one another. It's so complicated. All of this then only begins to explain this act. Do you think I can do all of this in 140 characters? It's not gonna happen. But every case I've ever worked is this complex. This is just the nature of working homicides. Something happens in a heartbeat. It takes me 30 years to put it back together. And when I do, she's still dead. This is the nature of evil. And this is why we know we have to evaluate evil differently. As a matter of fact, why do we call anything evil to begin with? How could we call, do you mean you don't like it? Do you mean it's evil to you? And by your opinion it's evil? Or do you mean it's transcendently evil for all of us? No matter who you are, it's truly evil. Really? Well, if it's truly evil, What are you using as your transcendent standard by which you would call something transcendently evil? Here's the problem. If evil is more than, if evil is just your opinion, you can remove all evil tomorrow by just simply changing your opinion. That doesn't work, does it? No. Because evil is actually more than just your opinion, the opinion of your group, the opinion of your nation, the opinion of our planet. It's truly transcendently evil because it's measured by a truly transcendent standard of good. The C.S. Lewis puts it this way. 
as an atheist, he said, you know, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. When I was complaining, this universe, what, what, what was I compla- comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You have to have a transcendent standard of just in order to call it. So if you're gonna try to explain evil, sometimes we say, well, gosh, you know, if there's a God, but there's evil, that excludes God. No, actually, if there's true evil, that requires God. Because you can't call this truly evil unless there's a true standard. All that's left to us is to figure out why God would allow it. But the idea that there's true evil requires God's existence because that's the measurement against which we're gonna call anything truly evil. This means you're back outside the room again. And this is the best explanation. He finishes this by saying this, of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing more but a private idea of my own, but if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. If it's really unjust, it means there must be a really just standard for good. 